<laughs> now you could be. What do you want to know? What's relevant in your spiritual life at this moment, at this stage? So what do you want to know? How to make space? No, not how to make space. Um, how to expand. Means, can you tell me in um, as non-mystical language as possible? <laughs> I'm, I'm an ordinary earthling. Is there any practical question you have in your Krishna conscious practice? Because I know you're newly initiated, newly practicing. So is there anything um, that would help you to go forward with your practice specifically? Any question you have? Any obstacles in your bhajan? That's a, it's a, just a yes or no question. Yeah, Is it okay to? Because you're clear about what you want in spiritual life. What do you want? Okay. But when you take initiation, you've committed to this particular line. So you want to know the truth, but you have some special emphasis in this line, right? So there's some. Hmm? Right, but it's like you're married, right? No. Okay. Oh, that's not a good example. Okay, then. <laughs> Say you're married. <laughs> then, once you have one husband, you don't look for another husband, right? So, well, but you know your husband, and you would like to discover life together. Right. 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 Exactly. Mean. So when you chose a um, way to God, and you chose. Is it a question about your spiritual life, something you want to know, or is it a comment, essay commentary? Commentary to Didi here. Uh, last week we had such some, and uh, where her question is heading is that uh, she is reading books by Paramahamsa Yogananda. Okay. And I was trying to explain to her 
that she should keep, if she's taking this decision, she should keep in this line because she's going to get confused mm. because it's different philosophies. Yeah. You know? And I believe it's there she's heading, right? So she's asking this question and she wants to know exactly how, what to do, how to, yeah. what line to follow. Right, got it. Because I was trying to explain to her, don't read all those books and all, because it will just confuse you. Yeah, I get the picture. Then, I got it. No, I didn't say which yeah. line, uh, line to follow. I just, we said after the service, and the chef, then I really enjoy to read this book because it's a beautiful language. And in my opinion, it's a true, uh, true descriptions of the biography. So when I want to share that, I do really enjoy it. So and mm. I got an opinion, oh, okay, you shouldn't read such type of books. Mm. I think we should read various books and then choose which you really would like about that mm. either uh, uh, right or individual or saying, yes, or saying, it doesn't mean that you copy everything. Got it. Yeah, I got the picture from both of you. It's clear. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Anangalini, anything in your mind? In your practical practice of Krishna consciousness, bhakti yoga, anything you need now to understand more clearly? To Yoga Nanda? Uh, yeah, and it's, a, it's an incredible book. Mm. Okay. You have no other thing in your practice that you want to know? Nothing else? Everything is going smooth? Chanting is nice? Meditation is nice? Uh, no, I cannot say it's smooth. Okay. It's going. I do have some more questions. Okay. Sunabru, Subhadra. Subhadra Ma. Prabhu, I would like to know more about Bhagavan Krishna. About? About Bhagavan Krishna. Okay. Very nice, that's nice. Past times, and I would like to know more about his philosophy because we knew. Yeah. So I want to know everything. Okay. But you're in the correct place. Anybody else from the old schoolers or new schoolers? Hey, what's your name again? Annie. Annie, that's right. Where did we meet before? Where did you come? Uh, oh, in Leelanath's house on Christmas Eve. Yeah. And you came with your son. Yeah. Chris? Yeah. Good. Nice to see you again. You have any question? Anything you want to know about spiritual life? No, no. Okay. Anybody? One more. We can hear one more. And then my hard drive is full. <laughs> What's the difference between chanting on your japa and hearing uh, the holy names uh, and, and by it's like uh, music or something like that? Okay. Are they one more powerful than the other? Okay. All right. Okay, so everyone please pray for me. I'm so exhausted in my bones. I don't. I can't do my service. I know I can't give you what I could give you if I was had had a day off somehow in the past nine weeks. <laughs> I'm fried, but I'm going to do my best by the grace of God. And um, I'm only. My only disappointment is that I, I could have given more if I just was a little bit nervous system was a little more nourished. But no complaints. All's good. Shirade Govinda. Agyana Timirandasa Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Guru Venam Guru Devam Narayanam Bande Brindavan Nivasinam Ananta Gunabushit Koti Vatsayarupinam Nama Shrishtam Manu Mapi Sachiputra Matra Swarupam Rupam Tasya Grajam Rupurim Maturim Gostavatim Radha Kundam Girivara Maho Radhika Madhavasam Rapto Yasya Pratit Kripaya Sri Gurum Tamnatosmi 
Namaste Guru Devaya Sarva Siddhi Pradayane Sarva Mangala Rupaya Sarva Ananda Vidayane Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manubhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kardamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Nitananda Maham Bande Kanilambita Muktikam Chaitanya Graja Rupena Pavitri Krita Bhutalam Ananda Lila Maya Bigrahaya Hema Vadivyacha Visundaraya Tasmai Maha Prema Rasa Pradaya Shri Chaitanya Chandraya Namo Namaste He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Shri Radha Kanta Namastate Mahabhava Swarupam Tam Krishna Priyavari Asi Prema Bhakti Pradhi Devi Radhi Ketvam Namam Yaham Shri Rupa Rati Manjar Joram Grisevaika Gridna Asankina Pijanu Shavraje Vasos Tume Nisham Brindai Tulasi Devai Priyai Keshava Sitcha Krishna Bhakti Pradhi Devi Satavatai Namo Namaha Namaste Giri Rajaya Shri Govardhana Namine Ashe Shakresha Nashaya Paramananda Daini Radhe Shikeli Prabhuta Vinoda Vinyasa Vigyamba Javandi Tangrim Kripalu Tadakila Vishwavandyam Shipurna Masin Shirasana Mami Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Shri Adaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So first of all, I take shelter of the holy name of my spiritual master, Paramaraditta Mishila Rupada Padma, Nittandira Pavishtam Vishnu Parastotra Tashi Shila, Bhakti Vedanta Shri Narayan Goswami Maharaj Gurudev. Similarly, I take shelter of the Lord's feet of my Abhinishikshu Guru Pada Padma Paramaradita Mishila Bhakti Vedanta Madhusudan Goswami Maharaj and our Paramaradita Param Guru Devs Nittadira Pavishtu Mishra Pashtra Bhakti Pragyan Kesav Goswami Nittadira Pavishtu Mishra Pashtra Bhakti Vedanta Swami Maharaj Shri Prabhupada Nittadira Pavishtu Shri Bhakti Rakshak Shri Raghu Swami Maharaj and the whole Rupa Nuga Gaudiya Guru Bhava and to all Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis all the devotees of the Lord that ever have been or ever will be I offer my heartful respect to everyone and to everyone who's come here eager to hear Bhagavad Kata, Krishna Kata and to grow in spiritual life. I offer my respects to the feet of all the pilgrims, to the Hari Kata and to the Kirtan. And I humbly request everyone's blessings. Please help me, God, to do my service nicely for everyone's spiritual welfare, not just to pass the time and surely not to waste the time. Hare Krishna. So some very interesting questions. Spiritual life, a healthy spiritual life means questions. Healthy spiritual life means new questions. All the time in our spiritual life, there should be some unanswered question. If we're really thinking, if we're really trying, if we're really praying and seeking and endeavoring, 
There will always be something we don't know, and we're aware of that. Some darkness that we're reaching into, reaching for the hand of Sri Guru in the darkness. This is dynamic spiritual life. You know, I started seeing in Trinidad, in the airport, this billboard, and then I saw it here also, driving to the beach the other day, a big billboard for rum. It's very dark rum, and it says, perfection has a darker side. <laughs> Have you seen it? Black gold. Black gold. To me, in my life at this stage, and for a long time, probably since I was six years old or, more, or before, this black gold, the mercy and darkness has been pretty much the most relevant thing to me. How to find grace in pain, instead of like, ah, how to heal the pain with spiritual life, how to avoid the pain with spiritual life, how to transcend or make peace with the pain of life, but how to find God everywhere, find grace, find mercy, even in pain, in failure, in suffering. Because if you can find it there, then you'd never be afraid. And there wouldn't be any conflict in your life. You just go soft in the hands of mercy. You know, one of the most intimate services one friend can do for another is to give a massage. Right? It's healing for the body. It's softening. It's healing for the psyche, psyche emotional body. Everything so intimate, so deep connection, so personal. You know, we're always moving with this personal space, not only like physically, but like in how much we can say, how are you doing? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good, thanks. There's so much space between our worlds. Our inner world and the worlds of others are completely like no connection. Some slight, you know, there's some smell of kindness that travels across the gulf between us when there is kindness, when there is something in common. But really we're like, floating in space without being able to touch anyone or to speak of others even you know our family members and things don't really understand us not at the deepest level so so <laughs> black gold the gold, the wealth if you can find grace every oh massage, right, massage, thank you guys have to help me a little bit <laughs> my brain is not working properly, it's too so massage is such an intimate exchange and service right, but if you, if you really need a massage, then you'll be tight. You know when you have knots in your shoulders, you've been working hard, or some, you made some wrong move, you threw something out, then you're wounded inside. You can't look at the outside, there's no blood coming out, but inside you have a wound. You have a knot. And it hurts when you move and it obstructs you. And if someone really loves you and cares about you, then they could be resting themselves or doing anything else, but instead, they use their energy, their bodily energy, to serve you. How? Working on that knot. Squeezing it, squeezing it, pressing it, twisting it, rubbing it. And what does it feel like? Ow! It hurts because there's all these actually crystallized acids inside of a knot in the muscle. Crystallized acids. They're actually cr fine little crystals. Like, you know, MSG? Monosodium glutamate? People put in Chinese food and different things to make it taste good. You know why it tastes, makes you taste, enhances flavor? Because it's fine, fine little crystals, like shards of glass. And when you eat it, it slashes your tongue, micro slashes your tongue, so it bears the taste buds more raw. And the taste buds get a deeper experience of the flavor. More salty, more sweet, more sour. That's how it enhances the flavor, by micro slashing your tongue open. Tiny little crystals. So in a similar way, but in a less pleasurable way, there's microcrystals, crystalline acidic structures in the knots, in your muscles. And when they get squeezed, those crystals are cutting into your muscle. It hurts. All over it hurts. It's so tender. But if you fight it, 
it, you won't get any benefit. You have to actually ah, go soft in the hand of your friend. Go soft and let him dig in there. Let him dig in there and ah, work it. Swedish deep tissue massage. Ah, ah, ah. You have to surrender to it. And then that so intimate but so painful love it breaks those crystalline structures, those painful, acidic, foreign, unbelonging structures that are knotting you up. They get broken by that massage. And they get smeared out. And they get dissipated. And you become soft and limber and healed. Physically, emotionally, mentally. Everything by massage. That's how it works. But you have to trust your friend. Even though it hurts. Ow! It's not like, I hate you, what are you doing? Bam! Thank you, I know this is good for me. We know it's good for us because we understand and we just... <sighs> go as much as you can, go soft in those hands. In the same way, Paramaraditama Shiva Bhakti Rakshak Shri Raghuswami Maharaj, he said that behind everything is the hand of Krishna. The hand of God is behind everything in our life. His hand is there. And His hand is full of, made of, love and affection. This is the speciality of this line of bhakti yoga that you won't find in the lines of gyan, in the lines of karma yoga, in any other mystic yogic practice. Only in bhakti, only in that spiritual line that goes to the highest understanding of Bhagavan, of Godhead, which is Bhagavan, the person of God, only Bhakti Yoga can give you that ultimate shelter. That reality is alive and conscious and full of affection. And everything that's happening to me is really intelligently designed to mercy me. To help me and heal me. And if I just stop fighting it and let it, it'll work. It'll work the most intimate possible exchange is possible. The most deepest healing and sweetest friendship, exchange of friendship is possible when we go soft in the hand of God. He's called Parameshwar. He's the supreme controller. We have to decide, is he or not? I have to, we have, you can't be on the fence. In spiritual life, you can't be on the fence. You have to make up your mind. And sometimes that means taking a step in the dark. In fact, at every stage there should be a step in the dark. Because there's so much we don't know. Like you said, there's so much more in the space of our paradigm. We can only see so far. And beyond what we've seen, as far as our flashlight of our acquired knowledge goes, there's a gulf of darkness of what we don't know beyond that. We're moving on the strength of faith and hope and love because we haven't seen Krishna. We don't know that Krishna is real. We fail something, or we wouldn't have taken initiation. We wouldn't have gotten married into this line, Krishna's line. Initiation means more than marriage. It's more than marriage. It's more intimate than husband and wife, anything. You're giving your heart into the hands of your spiritual master, to the hands of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. To the hand of God, do with me what you want. I trust that you're real and you love me and I'm going to let you do it. I'm going to do my part, you're going to do your part. And I'm going to let you do your part. Because his part is 99% of it. You know, this path of spiritual life, success in spiritual life, is 99% God's doing grace. And 1% ours. Because he's so big and we're so small, we can't do much. But what we can do, that 1% is a lot for us. It's everything for us. It's 100% of our endeavor. 1% of what has to get done for us to become perfect and enlightened and free of death and pain and sorrow and darkness. Maybe less than 1% is our doing. But it's going to take 100% of our energy to do that 1%. So we can't be on the fence. Or we won't get anywhere. We were speaking last night. Janma Koti Sukritir Nalabhite. No, in Vrinda Temple. Janma Koti Sukritir Nalabhite. Millions of lifetimes of doing auspicious things like hanging out in the ballpark of spiritual life, chanting and going to the programs, holding programs, attending programs, taking prasad and doing RT and doing all the right things for millions of lifetimes is never going to give you enlightenment. Never. 
It's not enough. The form is not enough. It's the substance that matters the most. What you do with your heart, what your intention is, what your desire is. So, I want to speak a little bit about the speciality of this line, Bhakti Yoga. Why do this? There's many things we can learn, like she, even Krishna says in Srimad Bhagavatam to Uddhav, he says, now I'm finished with my pastimes in this world, in seven days I'm going to leave. I'm going back to the spiritual world and a great flood is going to come and my city of Dwarka will be destroyed. All of my family members are going to disappear and um, Uddhav, you should take sannyas. And Uddhav said, um, can you give me a little more instruction than that? I should take sannyas, I should leave everything, and then what? And do what? What am I going to do without you? What am I going to do as a sannyasi? What am I going to do when everything as I know it is finished? Krishna said, first of all, you should think for yourself. Yes, it's very, very good and necessary and critical for spiritual life to ask relevant questions to those who have the capacity to answer. That's irreplaceable. We must. It's a process of inquiry. And if we're really practicing, we'll have these live inquiries. Oh, there's something I need to know. If we don't have any question, if we don't have any inquiry about how to pro progress in our spiritual life, it's a bad sign. That means we're not thinking very deeply. And if we're not thinking very deeply, then everything we're doing is just form and no substance. We're spinning our wheels, revving our engine, and driving nowhere. Big noise. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare Bol Prabhu. Mangala, Shri Guru, Gauda. All the big noise and all the big show. Just revving the engine. We're like a bow, twanging a bow. Pang! 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 Getting arms so strong. Look how I can pang! Shoot my bow, but no arrow. Look, I'm getting so good at the form. So good at the form. So good at the form. I know all the songs in the whole song book by heart. I know all the tunes. I can do everything. I can... I learned how to do the chamara with one hand and ring the bell with the other hand. It's more difficult than rubbing your belly and patting your head. Ring a bell with one hand and do the fancy chamara with the other hand. I can do it all. I'm getting so good at the form. But when I'm alone in my room at night, everyone's asleep, and I look at my heart, how do I feel about my spiritual life? Am I nourished? Or worse, am I hungry? Maybe I'm not nourished, but if I'm not nourished, at least if I'm hungry, there's hope. But if I'm not nourished and I'm not hungry, I'm dead. I'm a spiritual zombie. <laughs> I'm a spiritual zombie. Just kidding. Bah! Bah! That's why I'm not the one. Bah! <laughs> getting beat by Maya, getting beat by material nature, old age and disease and death and betrayal and car stolen and accidents and bills and all these things are still oppressing me and I'm doing the whole form of spiritual life but I'm still suffering like every other karmi. <coughs> That's not good. Just a zombie getting beat. Bam! We want to live. We're doing the only reason we came to this line is because we had hope that this is a better life. A more real life. There's more pleasure here than in going to the bar or going to the beach, or going to wherever, that we had hope, this is actually, that's why we come to spiritual life, to enjoy for pleasure. And that's legal, that's okay. That's the only thing that makes us real, is that the soul is hungry for pleasure. If we're doing it because this is the thing I'm supposed to do, or my parents taught me, or like, you know, this is the thing I'm supposed to do to be right, so I'm on the right team and I'm not going to hell. It's dead, it's nothing, it's useless. What's real and honest is, we came here for pleasure. For a higher pleasure than sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or anything in this world can give. Super Bowl. Or even Super Bowl. <coughs> Hardy Bowl. <laughs> the Super Super Bowl. So we have to take our pulse. We have to be... Step one in spiritual life, before even like chanting Hare Krishna, step one, before anything is, check yourself. Know yourself. What do I want? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why have I taken initiation in this line? Why did I come? What was it? What do I want? If we're out of touch with what we want, we're going nowhere. 
It's all about our desire. Janma Koti Sukutirna Labhita. You can do all the form forever and it won't make an inch of progress. What makes the progress is our desire. I want this. I want this. When we lose touch with that original, you know, our fresh, like passionate, youthful desire when we first fell in love with Krishna, we first wanted to do this thing, so much passion, so much hope. Then we were making so much progress. You know, like a drug dealer, they give the first hit free. And the, and the kids are like, what is that? I'll try that. Wow, I need more. Okay, now you have to pay. So in the beginning, spiritual life is like that. It's like we first start chanting Holy Krishna, we do something, and we get, whoa, whoa. I remember before I came in this line, for five years I practiced all different types of meditation and different types of shamanism and all kinds of things. I was bumble <coughs> bumblebee philosophy, way of the bumblebee. I stick my face in a flower until I taste the nectar. Ah, oh, it's there. God's here in the Sufis. God's here in mystic Christianity. God's here in the shamans, indigenous magic medicine. God's here in Tibetan Buddhism. God's here, God's here, God's here. And I stick my face in that flower as long as I want to. And I'm free. And when I lose interest, something else catches me, then... Bleh. I go and taste that. Oh, it's everywhere and it's fascinating. I like this so much, I studied in university. I got my degree studying world religion. What people do to make life sacred. You know, I saw the pictures of the indigenous peoples, Americans, North and South, with feathers in their hair and beautiful paintings on their face and, you know, blowing smoke and shaking rattles and their whole life just looks so rich and like real. I looked at my life in my little square townhouse and like my square box of cereal in the morning and square little checks coming out and driving on a square grids of like left, right. This roads all go square in my little square car and I'm like, eh, this life is so square, so dry. And those pictures, they look like they're really enjoying life. The spirit of the eagle, you know? Wow. <laughs> I want to be one with the spirit of the eagle flying. My soul soaring free. Wow. And when I heard about Radha Krishna, where is Seva Kunj? This there's a little one there in the middle. There's five pictures. That little one, Radha Krishna sitting on the sitting together. I saw that picture when I was getting my world religions degree. When I saw that picture, I said, What is this? And the devotee was showing me, he said, This is God. Radha Krishna, they're young lovers, 15 years old forever, in love with each other. And it came in my heart, oh, in millions of lifetimes, I'm never going to come up with anything more beautiful than this. As, you know patchwork quilt? You get all the scraps of cloth and you sew them together and you make a quilt? I was doing that, making my own religion, because I was learning, tasting, I taste it, I know this is real, I know this is real, I know this is real. I knew all these things are real from inside, not because anybody told me, I can taste this, it's real these different paths and meditations and religions. And I was patchworking them together. <laughs> Making my own altar in my room. And, you know, I had, I had a painting, my altar has a big tree. And in the tree is Jesus Christ, the black jaguar from Amazonian shamanism, and green Tara from Tibetan Buddha, Tibetan Buddhism. I was like, these three, they hitting all the right bases, hitting all the right notes for me. And I was chanting Tibetan mantras on a Catholic rosary given by my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> Some dreadlocks and smoking ganja in the cemetery chanting Tibetan mantras on a Catholic rosary. Oh, I'm blending everything together. My own style, my own religion. And I saw this, Radha Krishna. God is this. These divine lovers. Lost in each other's love and affection. And immediately this, my heart just told me, hey listen. <laughs> In millions of lifetimes of patchworking and researching and tasting and sample plattering everything, you never come up with anything this beautiful, ever. And that moment was like, <coughs> defeated. And it's, you know, the bumblebee, he tastes all the flowers, but when he comes to the lotus, the lotus flower has something that nothing else has. He likes it so much that when the sun goes down and the lotus flower closes, the bumblebee gets stuck inside. Bumblebee's nature is what? Free. Wherever I like, I go and do what I like, I taste as I like. But he's happy to be captured in that lotus flower. Sun goes down and... Bumblebees with their teeth, they can... They can burn through. Bamboo. Bamboo actually is harder than steel. Truly. Somehow this... You know, pressure per square inch, or I don't know how to explain that, but... Bamboo is harder than steel. And a bumblebee, he can burrow through bamboo. But that soft lotus petal 
cannot, cannot go out from there because he's defeated, he's finished and captured by a special sweetness he never got anywhere else. It's not only one lifetime, it's lifetimes and lifetimes. If we're sitting in this room having this conversation now, it's because each person in this room has spent dozens and hundreds of lifetimes seeking the truth. We have Sukriti. We have made spiritual endeavors, our spiritual bank account of sincere prayers and reaching and endeavoring and calling grace. We've called enough grace, we've magnetized enough grace toward us that after thousands of lifetimes, we can sit here in the living room, in a casual place, and speak about the absolute highest revelation of the Supreme Absolute Truth and how we are going to very quickly and smoothly, directly attain that and be finished with this wandering in this crazy world. So, it's natural to be curious. It's natural um, to want to supplement. And if we don't, the thing about reading is our ability to understand what we read is about 99% on our present understanding. We read something and we read it through the filter of the understanding we have. So we can read Bhagavad Gita, we can read Chaitanya Charitamrita, we can read these high exalted scriptures, but we'll only understand as much as our present understanding allows us to understand. It can be right in front of us and it go through. Like Gurudev said, like a spider, when she makes her web, she goes around and 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 she makes that weave tighter and tighter and tighter. So that when flies go through, they get stuck. But in the beginning, there's just one or two rings. You know, there's the, these bars that go out like this, and then the spider, she goes like that, and there's one or two rings, and flies in, bang, boom, zing, as they like coming and going. She can't catch much. But the more that she goes around and around and around, the more experience that we have in spiritual life, the more that we catch when we hear, when we read. So it's really important, way, a thousand times more important than reading is to hear. Hear Harikata. That's the most important thing in our spiritual life, especially in the beginning, especially in the middle, and especially at the end. Hearing Harikata from those who know more, because they can distill, they can do with a hundred lifetimes or a hundred years of work, research work, they can distill into five minutes and give it to us. You know, so many points that are uh, fragmented, they've already assembled in their meditation and in their studies under their masters, they've already assembled together into like 50 points into a ball, and they very easily in natural language give us that this composite of understandings. And then they give another one. Now you have, all you have to do is put two 50-piece understandings together and you have a 100-piece understanding. That's all you have to do. Instead of one by one by one, very tedious to research on our own. Therefore, Sri Brahmaji, the original person in this universe, the oldest and wisest, the architect of the universe, Brahma, he said, Gyane prayasa mudapasya namanta eva. Give up the quest for empiric knowledge, to work it all out yourself, studying, running here and there. Give it up. And stane stitam shutikatam danuvan manobir. Whatever your situation is, whether you're married, whether you're renounced, whether you're, whatever your life destiny is going on, let it go automatically. Let it be what it is. Don't endeavor, I should get married, or I should get, take sannyas, or I should do this, or I should change something. You let your situation be what God has made, what karma and destiny has made, and you, by your body, speech, and mind, make your priority in life to hear from those who have pure transcendental knowledge. By that, that person who is Ajita, unconquerable supreme Godhead, will be conquered by you. How? And why is it? Why do we want to conquer God? I'm not in the business of conquering everyone. I want to be free. Let God be free. No, we we'll conquer him by love and affection. Completely conquer him till he feels, I am yours. And that is extremely desirable. If the supreme controller who controls everything and we are in his hand, if he comes in your hand, in the hand of your love and affection, so pure and honest and mature, real bhakti, that's something very high and special. So, Srimad Bhagavatam is very special because it gives us what no other scripture in the world gives us. 
the highest and clearest understanding of the Absolute Truth. Bhagavatam says, first of all, look. Go outside. Open your eyes. See that thing in the sky? That big white thing that's chasing after that big golden thing that changes the whole atmosphere from day to night? See those things? Sun and moon? Those are the eyes of God. See those big things over there? that are tearing the clouds and the rain is pouring down and rivers are coming from them. those are mountains those are the bones of God and the clouds and the rain this is the breath of God and the rivers and oceans His flowing veins Milky Way His mind the cosmos is the entire universe the cosmos is God look you, yourself, everything, everywhere whoa everything is Him there is nothing but Him everything is part of Him Wow, if you can get that picture, then you won't be afraid of anything, you won't be worried about anything, and you'll be always shocked and dazzled and full of awe. Wow. It's the beginning of spiritual life, indigenous religion, to worship something bigger than me. Wow, the universe, everything is, this is great. Bhagavatam says, yes, it's true. But, there's more. We're going to follow this metaphor, like milk. If you have milk, from milk, you can heat it up, and put a little sour in there, and it changes, transforms into what? Yogurt. Right? Nothing else. It's just milk, but it's transformed and it became something totally different. Different texture, different taste, different nourishing qualities. It has different medicinal properties in Ayurveda. But it's the same thing, just transformed. And then if you churn yogurt very vigorously, what do you get from that? Butter, thick, creamy butter, completely new thing. Now that thing that was originally milk became sour yogurt, now becomes sweet butter. Different flavor, different texture, different uses. And then you take that butter, golden butter, and you boil it in fire. And something happens to it. Some impurities, some fine impurities come out, and there's an essence left, a golden essence. Ghee. Milk and ghee, there's so many stages apart from each other, so different. But ghee is nothing but milk. It's nothing but milk. But it's the essence of the essence of the essence. The transformed, transformed, transformed essence. So the first understanding like that, Bhagavatam, the scriptures say, look, everything is God, the universe is God. There's only God, there's nothing other than God. Wow! It's like milk. And those who are nourished, they drink that. Wow, everything is God. Wow, the universe, man, it's speaking to me. I trust in the universe. The universe takes care of me. People have this relationship with the universe. The universe hears me. The universe takes care of me. The universe speaks to me. Okay, some people, they're satisfied with milk, but some people have more hunger. They want more. They're not satisfied. Okay, milk is nice, but I want to taste something more, something richer. Is there more than that? And the scriptures say, yes, there's more than that. Taste this yogurt. Try this. So look into this cosmos, this spinning cosmos, full of planets and not only what we see with our telescope, but planets full of devas and devis and celestial beings. Below us, planets full of serpents, emperor snakes, nagas, hells and heavens, all types of dimensions, it's not a three-dimensional universe we're living in. We're living in a very cosmic, far-out, mystical, 20-dimensional universe. Even in this room, Mike Tyson right now is, bam, knocking somebody out. Right here in the air. We don't see it. Right now, in this room, the Super Bowl is going on. Wow. Right now, in this room. But we don't see it. I see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's because he's on acid. <laughs> that doesn't count. Or it's because he has a metal plate in his head and he's picking up the Wi-Fi <laughs> on the internet, on the YouTube, on the, in the air right now there are radio waves and internet waves and inside of those waves is all the pictures and sounds of things going on all over the world. And in the past, things that happened 50 years ago. The moon landing is going on in this world right now. You can click on YouTube moon landing and you can watch it in this room right now. It's in the freaking air, man. <laughs> but we don't see it. But if you had the right instrument, you could extract from the invisible air 
the Super Bowl. And thousands of million people going, <sighs> this universe is far out, but we take it for do -de do eat my cereal, drive my car, go to work, go to sleep. So Bhagavatam is saying, yes, this universe is divine, it's alive, it's breathing, it's God. But if you look at that spinning cosmos full of so many dimensions and devas and demons and wars of celestial demons and gods going on right now, invisibly, you know, there's disembodied beings moving through the room that are looking for someone to hold on to and live their life through. All kinds of strange dramas are going on visibly and invisibly. At every moment on this plane and on 14 planes of the universe. And within that amazing, diverse, wild kaleidoscope of God's cosmic form, there's a beautiful, silent, all-encompassing light, Brahman, filling everything. If you tune to that station by Mystic Yoga, Om, you tune out all of this wild, spinning, universal form of God and you go to a deeper level and you see that actually beyond that is just empty light, no duality, no up and down and black and white and red and green and just is just the quality of sub existence, pure, undistilled, undifferentiated, unqualified existence. We can't even think about that because our brain is so full of variety, so full of duality. We can't even imagine that non-dual existence principle. Whoa. And the yogis, they're working really hard. Om, aham brahmasmi, aham brahmasmi. I am that light, you are that light, tattvamasi, everything is that light. <sighs> to dissolve their complicated self into that simple is. Working hard to do that. Okay, they like that. They're satisfied with the yogurt. But Bhagavatam says, there's more than that. You hungry? Some people are like, no, no, we're satisfied with this. But some people, they step forward out of hundreds and hundreds of people, some people not hungry at all. They're not interested. They'd rather go to the gutter and <laughs> drink the gutter juice of the nurasa, the flavors of material enjoyment that are full of pain and disappointment and betrayal and divorce and disease and cancer and surgery and all these painful things, part of being material. Most people, they just want to drink the gutter juice of material existence. But some spiritually minded people, they want the milk of the universal understanding. Some want more than that. They want the Brahman yogurt. And some want more than that. Is there more than that? Bhagavatam says, yes, here, try this. Big blob of sweet makan. Butter. What is that? Oh. Within that spinning, wild, kaleidoscopic cosmos, within that all-encompassing, pure, oneness, light, Brahman, there are points of light that are even brighter, and they're everywhere. Every, every, everywhere. And if you zoom in on any one of them, you'll see Him there. Paramatma, the Super Soul is there. Higher than the universal understanding, higher than the oneness principle of Brahman, is the Paramatma. That Bhagavan, Vishnu, is a person, is described clearly in the mystic yogis. The goal actually of mystic yoga is to see the Paramatman, to see him within the heart. You know people do yoga standing on their head and twisting and everything and all these asanas. Why? To bring the life airs, the prana in the body to equilibrium, to stand still, so it won't disturb anymore and they can like a turtle draw inside, go into their heart and approach the lotus of their heart and see Paramatma there, Vishnu in the heart the Supreme Controller, who's moving this wild cosmos and from whose body that brilliant Brahman light shines. They want to see Him. He's everywhere. And if you can see Him, then you see, ah, my best friend. We have no friend in this world, really. Everyone around us is doing business with us. He loves you because you're beautiful. She loves you because you have money in your pocket. Etc., etc., etc. And when the money's gone and the beauty's sagging, see how He loves you now, how she loves you now. Everything in this world is business, top to bottom. The highest level of love and affection in this world is mother for her baby. But even that has a material cause. There's a material reason, a business transaction there. Mother loves her baby, the baby that comes from her body. She don't love, 
She's not going to change. You're not going to change the diapers of somebody else's baby across the road. You know, if somebody, if your baby is in the hospital sick, you would sell your house, sell your car, sell a kidney. You would do anything for your baby. You'd be awake in the hospital all night like that. But somebody else's baby is in the hospital. You pray. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so we love those who are connected with our body, with this identity. They give some kind of, there's some kind of bodily connection. But it's all business. We have no friend, you know. One way or another we'll be betrayed. If we're really attached to each other, mutually attached, still death and time will cut that. One has to die first. Even you guys get old together, Raghunath Shashikala, Vasa Dave Kamala, you get old, you love each other so much, you get old, still one of you is going to have to go first. And the other one's going to have to cry. For the rest of your life. No friend. Even time will cut that. We have one friend that never leaves us, life after life, and that's that Paramatma, that Vishnu super soul in the heart. When we change bodies and we lose all of our family connections in this life, we go into a new family, a new body, a whole new language to learn, a whole new maybe species even. But that Paramatman, that super soul, the Lord in the heart, He goes with us. He never leaves us. Actually, we couldn't survive without Him near us. When people say the conscience, my conscience told me I shouldn't do it, that's Him. He's always giving us guidance. If we would turn to Him and seek His wisdom, He would guide us in spiritual life. When we pray and we get answers, where is it coming from? From the Paramatma in the heart. He's real, He's with us, but we're just ignoring Him. We're not listening, our ears are so full of other concerns we can't hear. And He's just peacefully waiting, He's not in a rush. Millions and millions of lifetimes He can watch us jumping into the sewage of material existence, making so much bad karma and entangling ourselves. And, okay, He respects our free will. He respects us. We're doing mad, mad madness. You know? Even drugs and, and, and violence and every kind of sinful thing, He respects our free will. Okay, you're going to do that and then you'll taste the reaction and you'll learn. Okay. He's like the best mother. I trust you, baby. I trust in your wisdom, your inborn wisdom. You'll get it. So some people, they're really satisfied. They taste that butter. Oh, wow. I can see not only is he in my heart, he's in Nika's heart. My best friend is there too. He's in her heart. Whoa, respect. When people say namaste, pranam, it means like that person in front of us, they may or may not be living a very agreeable life. They may be immoral. They may be anything, but we still namaste, pranam. Because God is in their heart. My friend who's guiding me, who nourishes me, who's my real mother and father and my everything, that paramatma, super soul, He's in your heart too. He's in every living thing's heart. He's in the bumblebees and the blades of grass and the chickens. And that's why we're vegetarian. Because we don't want to do violence toward our friend and who's dear to him. As much as we're dear to him, that chicken is dear to him. Therefore, we don't kill a chicken have a chicken sandwich. Because it would hurt our friend. So many, many are satisfied with that. And they do mystic yoga to realize, oh, my friend is everywhere. He's in everything, he's controlling everything, and no fear, peace. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Means that at the end of yoga class, they're saying that, but the end of yoga class, the end of this course of yoga, Hatha Yoga, Ashtanga Yoga, is to see the Paramatman and attain Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. God is everywhere doing everything. I'm not worried about anything. Don't judge anybody anymore. A dog that's eating stool in the street, or a big elephant decorated with gold, or you know, some sannyasi speaking on the Vyasasan like this giving class, or somebody selling drugs on the street corner. <laughs> respect, respect, respect. You know, he's everywhere. He's doing, he knows what he's doing. I can't judge what he's doing. And some people are so satisfied with that. Their hunger is satisfied. But there's a few Rare, rare souls out of so many. We're like a filter, right? There's a, there's the, most people don't have any interest in spiritual life. And out of them, some of them are interested to see that God is the whole universe. Wow, cool. Then out of those, and a few go further and they see, okay, the Brahman, the light, Om. A few of those go a little further and they see Paramatma, the living conscious person, not just the empty light, but a smiling face and intelligence. And still the finest few trickle through the end. And they get the finest, ultimate conclusion of God-realization, which is Bhagavan.
the personality of Godhead, that beyond this entire cosmic material creation, material cosmos is not just our massive universe, but unlimited trillions of trillions of trillions of uncountable universes, beyond that expansive material existence, beyond the light, there's a spiritual abode, there's a spiritual world full of variety. There's the duality of this world, the variety of this world that's just complicated and ties us up like a fly stuck in a sticky web of a spider. And beyond that is the oneness, the light. And beyond that on the other side is a new type of variety, which is transcendental variety, where there's no sticking and untying, it's everything is freeing, the heart is opening in every moment, seeing the beauty of divine variety of the spiritual world. That God is more than just empty light or an abstract principle or the material universe or even more than localized super soul in the heart. He's himself. He's someone with his own personality, his own fragrance. His body has a unique fragrance like all types of flowers have their own fragrance. God has his own fragrance. He has his own color. We say Krishna is blue or he's black or he's sham. But there's, no, there's no color in this world for sham. There is no sham in this world. He has his own color. He's the color of Shringar Ras. He's the color of the mellow of the highest divine amorous love. Lover and beloved, the cream essence of the joy of if two transcendental bodies were to meet together and love each other to the absolute maximum with unfailing, undying, pure transcendental bodies that are not full of guts and stool and sprouting stubble here and stinking and these rotten flesh bags, but are divine bodies. Divine Cupid, the essence of conjugal divinity, that's the color of his skin. He smells like that, he looks like that. He looks like, in this world, those who see him, they beg forgiveness. The poets, they beg forgiveness. I tried in so many ways, I compared your eyes to lotuses, I compared your skin to a thundercloud about to burst with juice and rust and rain. I compared you to so many things, but there's no comparison for you. I did some offense by saying your eyes are beautiful like a lotus flower because your eyes are infinitely, infinitely more beautiful than the most gorgeous blooming lotus flower. The softness of your skin cannot be compared with fresh cream. There's no comparison for you. But for us to have some idea to approach and worship, to send our thoughts and our prayers and our love and affection in a direction, we use words. And our words are like a finger pointing at the moon. Ah, look. The words are not the thing. When I say that Krishna looks like his complexion is dark like a rain cloud in monsoon season, we don't see so much here, we get some hurricanes and things, but in India, sometimes you see monsoon cloud just bulldozing across the sky, huge and so deep, so black, it's like so rich. And that time is the end of hot, hot summer when you've just been baking and dry and like, people are going crazy. It gets so hot in Vrindavan. It gets so hot, the old people die. Every day somebody's dying. And you get nosebleeds and it's just like, oh, unbearable baking, baking heat. And then one day, the monsoon begins. The season changes. And that big, massive, dark, black cloud comes pushing across the sky and all the little white tufts, it just like bulldozes them out of the way. And this huge, like, it's like a black glacier sliding across the sky. And it comes, and it's so full, so full, so heavy, heavy, heavy with rain that it can't hold its own juice anymore, and it bursts. And that rain comes down. With it comes so much cool air. And in the temple, you know, we build the temples like Man Mohan's house, in the apartment where he lives, it's, you know, there's five floors or so, and it's all around like this, and the middle is empty. You know, it's like a big square building, and the middle is empty. So the temple's like that. You know, the rain comes right into the temple, and when the rain comes pouring down, it pushes this cool sky air, this sweet, fragrant, cool breeze from the rain, from the sky, gets like shoved into all the rooms. You know, when you're doty on the line, it was dry in three minutes because it was so hot and dry before. Now the breeze of the sky, the breath of the sky, is blowing your cloth, and just survive by that sweet rain and you just stand on the roof of the temple and your little gumshaw and your little cloth and just let the rain come down on you. And you oh. So Krishna Barhendra Yudharam Yaya Jagajivanadayane 
He looks like, his complexion is like that. The best comparison is Ganesham. He's Ganesham. He's dark like a rain cloud. Just about to burst, not with ordinary rain, but to burst with the mellows, with the flavor, with the flood of flavor of love and affection, of bliss like you never tasted, even in the white light, anywhere. The sweetness of his love, that he's a person and full of conscious affection, just pouring that affection on you. Can you imagine how much affection is in the heart of God for us? He looks like that. Bursting, and he has like a rainbow of seven colors spread across a thundercloud. So, Bahendra Yudha Ramyaya, he has such a charming peacock feather ornament on top of his hair. Radha Vidyud Vitangaya, and on him, like a brilliant golden thunderbolt against the background of a black cloud. Oh, Gorangi Shirali Katakurani, she's holding tightly her beloved Krishna, and she looks just like a Brilliant, holding still lightning bolt. He's walking along a soft mud. And he made a little footprint, little calf's little footprint. And that little footprint would be filled with water. Rain water would fill it up. That's, that compared to the shoreless ocean is the comparison between the love of Brahmananda, the bliss of Brahmananda, and the bliss of Premananda. Those who attain Brahman, impersonal Oneness, yoga perfection, they definitely have peace. But their enjoyment is like that. A cow's hoof prints, water, a thimbleful, compared to the ocean, the endless shore. Even the ocean is like, that's an insult to say that Premananda is like an ocean. Because an ocean has bounds and a bottom. But the ocean of the bliss of relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Absolute Truth is a person, and to fall in love with Him and accept Him as your lover, as your best friend, the most intimate person in your life, and He's everything and He's the Supreme Truth, that taste, there's no shore to that ocean. There's no bottom to the depths of that rust. So we're very fortunate to come in this line. And if we heard enough Harikata, if we heard enough and understood enough, then we wouldn't be interested to read things outside, other things here and there. Yoga, meditation, and different types of things, we wouldn't have the interest. It's not that it's wrong to study other things, it's not that it's wrong, it's natural to be curious. But once we have a glimpse, the tiniest little particle, one mist particle from that rain cloud would touch us, all the entirety of our capacity for curiosity would be invested in Krishna. Our entire capability to be curious about anything would be to be curious about what is the sound of his laughter? What is the fragrance of his breath when he's laughing and smiling? His teeth, when he smiles, looks like a row of white swans flying against that black cloud. If we had the finest, finest, finest connection, that's called faith, we wouldn't have any taste, any interest. And that's how people end up taking sannyas and giving up the whole world. Because they're getting more and more understanding that I don't have any time for anything but this. They give up even thinking what I'm going to eat today, where I'm going to sleep. They don't have one second to think, well, i got to do something to cook. i got to do something to like beg somebody for a chapati or like find a place to sleep tonight before it gets dark. They don't have any time for that. The more that this beauty of Bhagavan dawns in the heart, the more that the mind and heart, they just cannot tolerate to think about anything else. And that's called spontaneous devotion. Raghunuga Bhakti. And we're trying to move toward that. This line of Krishna consciousness is not just about how to learn to clap the drum and how to make circles, seven circles with the incense and three and three and one and seven and ring the bell and do all these rituals and say my prayers at the right time and do all these things. It's not what it's really about. That's all like the ballpark. That's all helpful and nourishing. What it's really about is falling in love. It's really about falling in love with God. So, that comes at a higher stage. I wanted to discuss about the stages, practical stages, <coughs> give a bit of the road map of where we are and how to go. Time is always chasing after us. So, if I remember the questions, you also had a question about chanting and hearing on a tape. So when we hear a tape, 
we don't get any benefit whatsoever. Because it's not a person. There's no faith. The tape machine has no faith. It doesn't have any heart. It's but it's the same vibration, though. It's not. There's a material vibration and a material vibration. Both won't help us spiritually. It's the holy name which is infused with faith and affection and hope that has effect. Like, I can chant 64 rounds a day. I could spend even 192 rounds, 3 lakhs. I could spend 16 hours a day chanting. But if I wasn't chanting with affection, with a desire for Krishna, all that chanting, 16 hours of chanting, wouldn't get me anywhere. It would have zero benefit. And when we chant, we can be, if we're mechanical like a tape machine, we also won't get any benefit. Both can be zero. What makes the whole difference of our spiritual life at every stage is what substance is inside of the form. We can, when we chant, we have the option that the tape machine doesn't have. The CD player doesn't have an option to try to reach out, reach in the darkness of not knowing for the hand of Guru and Krishna. When we chant and close our eyes with a prayerful mood, we can actually seek. I want you. I want to touch you. I want to make contact with you. I don't see you. I don't have realization. But it's darkness I'm in. But by my faith, I'm reaching. I want you. I want. I know you're here. I know you're in your holy name. And I want to touch even just the tips of your fingers. If I can't catch you, hold your hand. At least just for one second, let me touch you. Let me get some sense of your reciprocation, that you're a person, you're alive, and you're present with me, and this is a relationship. We have the option to seek relationship, and a CD player doesn't. It doesn't mean that when we chant, we're seeking relationship just because we're alive and the CD player is not. We can be just as dead as a CD player if we're just doing it like a machine, doing our ritual, doing our... I think a lot of the time, if I look at myself, if anyone else is like me, then I know that one struggle that many of us must have, because I have it, is doing my, getting my chanting done, not for the service of God, but for the service of my mind. So that my mind will tell me I'm not a bad person. I won't have to feel guilty that I didn't chant my 16 rounds that I promised Kuriya that I would chant. So I'm, instead of, for love and affection, reaching to make relationship with Krishna, I'm just trying to get done what I know I have to get done so I don't feel bad. I'm just doing something to make my mind, like, pacified. You know, it's like a human sacrifice. You know, there's a, so many stories in the Vedas and things. And so outside of this village, there's a demon living in the forest, and he would come and just ravage the village and kill people. But they agreed, okay, once in a full moon, and one would pull a lotto. You know, we take names from a hat, and somebody has to go and give themselves. And if once in a month we'll sacrifice a person to the demon in the forest, then he won't come tear up the village. Right? So they make this human sacrifice to pacify the monster. So in the same way, I'm making a sacrifice. I'm sacrificing my time and my everything to pacify the monster of my guilt and my shame and my material mind. Oh look, I'm doing spiritual things, I'm doing the right thing. I should feel good about myself. I'm so spiritual. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And it gets more and more dry as the years go by. Instead of getting more and more, you know, growing in spiritual life, I am less and less inspired. At the beginning I was more inspired. You know? I'm not saying myself, I'm saying this is a condition. If we're practicing properly and under guidance, we do grow year by year. Sometimes I get restless to get to a higher stage and I hear Gurudev speak to me. He said, put in your decades, kid. It means patient. You don't plant a mango seed and eat mangoes in the afternoon. <laughs> unless you're Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Who did? <laughs> it was mentioned that last night. He put a mango tree, mango seed in the earth. And immediately, because all his devotees were hungry and tired from San Kirtan all night, immediately a mango tree grew full of mangoes with no skin and no seed. Just rasa bombs. <laughs> all the way through, just rasa. And fragrant with the flavor of the Lord's hands as He picked and gave Himself to all His devotees. But He's God. He can plant a seed and have a fruit in five minutes. We can't. We planted the seed and it's going to take a little time for this bhakti to come. But we will have to be very careful how to we nourish it. You know, I just came from staying in Trinidad with Manohar Prabhu. And he runs, he maintains the temple by selling seedlings. Hare Krishna seedling is the name of his business. We're also little Hare Krishna seedlings. Right? We're little sprouts. But one guy came one day, vexed, and he was shouting. And he was saying, I bought this tray of seedlings from you and I planted them and they didn't live. They all died. So it's your fault. I'm going to sue you. All this stuff. Complaining. But no. Manohar, Prabhu, he sold live seedlings. They were good. 
and he screwed up somehow. That guy, he didn't take care of him, he didn't shade them if they needed shade, he put too much chemical, if it was this thing or the wrong chemical, he screwed up. And then he's blaming, Argh, I'm going to sue you. So Gurudev, he put this seed in our heart, he sprouted the seed in our heart at the time of initiation. He sprouts us with faith. Our inclination that I want to know God, the personality of God, not the light of God or the omnipresence or the universe of God or even the Paramatma of God. I want to know the person of God, that lover of Vrindavan. That faith, I want to love and serve Krishna. That's the sprout. Gurudev sprouted my seed that was sleeping for millions of lifetimes. He woke me up. But if it, it can die. It can die if I don't take care of it, I neglect it. If I don't avoid those things that are completely incompatible. You know, the most gross, basic things, don't eat meat, don't have illicit relationships, illicit sex, don't take drugs and alcohol, don't gamble. These things are very easy to go, I mean, people struggle their whole life with addictions, but those things are relatively easy compared to things like fame, you know, wanting to be respected by others and have a high position. Those things run so deep, so hard to get rid of. So, we have to be very careful. This little sprout of faith. Why we? it's not recommended to read things here and there and here and there without guidance is because most, this teaching of Krishna consciousness, Radha Krishna, the form of the divine couple, the supreme absolute truth, and how to enter into that most mystic inner chamber of their loving service, this teaching is extremely rare. Extremely rare in the world. And there's a whole bustling marketplace of so-called spiritual ideas and mystics and yogis and all kinds of people that have some kind of realization and they're banking on that and selling books on that but they have no understanding whatsoever of the love principle embodied in Radha Krishna's seva no idea and they may say love and God so much but if you look deep at their philosophy they may believe in an ultimate emptiness where there's no possibility of love and God so because we are not swans you know the swan they say that the last thing I'll say is this we are not Paramahamsas. We are not enlightened swans. Someone who's very high spiritually, who's very mature and has transcendental vision, they can take anything, anywhere, read anything, and they can extract the living good thing, the pure thing that helps them. If there's anything, if there's one drop, there can be a flowing river of water, and if there's one drop of milk, a swan, he can drink the milk out and leave the water. That's why great saints are called Paramahamsa. It doesn't mean that everybody with the name Paramahamsa is really a Paramahamsa. There's a thousand, thousand Paramahamsas lined up and they're ready for it. They may have some realization, but they don't have that thing and they cannot help us to touch that highest thing. Only in this line, this Guru Parampara, can help us go to that ghee, the golden essence. If that's what we make up our mind, it's not about you should do this, you should follow this line only. It's, it's what you want. Spiritual life is free will. If you want the golden essence, you want the highest understanding of God, you want pure love and affection, you want Krishna, then you have to hear specifically from those who are expert in the science of Krishna. If you hear from others who don't know anything and their principles may be backwards, we're not swans that can extract the good from the bad and we'll be drinking that river water if with any milk. Something may inspire us, but we're drinking all kinds of other stuff in there too. And our aspiration, the direction of our spiritual life will mutate. And won't go to that highest place. It will sidetrack and go somewhere else. Or like the wrong chemical in those seedlings, it will kill the seedling. So it's not a matter of like, you're only good if you believe in Krishna and you only read Krishna books. It's a matter of what you want. All the airport gates in the airport don't go to Lima, Peru. Only gate B34 goes to Lima, Peru. Not all paths go to the same place. Every path goes to its own place. So if you want, it depends where you want to go. We have to check our own heart and see what we want. And when you know what you want, when you play the field, the bumblebee, taste some of the things, and finally should, your heart will know, this is my place, this is my thing. And at that time, when you know, this is my place, this is my thing, this is my soul's inner craving, then you take initiation. And you put on the ring, or the three rings of commitment. But this is what I want. I'm offering my life in hope to realize Krishna, the beauty of the Cupid of Vrindavan and his beloved Radhika and the service of their lotus feet. So, 
We always have free will. If we don't have free will, then there's no possibility of real spiritual life and love. So we always don't let anyone push you. You shouldn't read this. You can't do that. Da, 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 da. Don't, don't. That's never going to work. It doesn't work. It's not real. Soul is not controlled by that. The soul is controlled by attraction. Bumblebee is attracted. So if you're attracted to something, you go toward it and no one can stop that. We cannot be dishonest. But after millions of lifetimes, when our spiritual bank account is full enough, when we're lucky enough, when we're supremely lucky, we become attracted to the highest principle. And we invest in the highest payoff, which is called bhakti yoga. Shuddha bhakti, pure bhakti, unmixed with anything else, any other kind of meditation or anything. Pure bhakti itself. Then we'll get the pure ghi essence, not otherwise. Okay? Um, just to, to um, go back on to my, my original question, um, when when I was in Vrindavan, I bought one of those little mantra boxes that you're so familiar with, you walk through yeah. the bazaars, and uh, do I get any benefits by leaving that on while I sleep, by hearing the mantra, Maha Mantra while I sleep? Is it Shri Prabhupada chanting? I, I don't know, I don't think so. No. No. It might be some musician. No. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not I mean, Shri Maybe you think about it, maybe in your mind you think of Krishna, in your subconscious mind you might think of Krishna, but the, the sound of that box is not helping you spiritually. Okay. If it reminds you somehow in your subconscious mind of Krishna, or if it was Shri Prabhupada, still the sound of Prabhupada's voice isn't going to help you, but it would help you think of a Mahabhagavat. It would help you think of the eternal associate of the Supreme Lord, and that helps to remember the Lord and His associates. And to hear, to listen, like we hear Shri Prabhupada's kirtan, we were driving up here listening to Shri Prabhupada's kirtan, you can hear his mood, his heart is just like, ah, like that thundercloud about to burst. He's so full of such a like sweet and deep and rich prophetic longing, and it's just like, oh, not getting any benefit from the sound. I mean, it's not a spiritual sound vibration coming. The guys who are recording in the recording studio, they got so much, but we're not getting, but we get that remembrance. Like this Harikata, I'm speaking Harikata tonight, and I'm not realized, I don't have Bhagavan in my heart. So Shabda Brahman, spiritual sound, is not coming from my mouth. But what I'm speaking helps us think and remember. Helps us think and remember spiritual subjects. And as much as my faith has grown, that much my breath and voice is carrying the measure of my faith. That's true. That's in the vibration, but it's not. Very significant, I can tell you from the inside. <laughs> The power of my voice is not very significant spiritually. But the subject matter itself, the principles of truth, the truth is alive. And sacred knowledge empowers us. It's like tools. And then when Maya comes and illusion comes and things that would bewilder us, we just, Phing! I heard this and I know better than that. Cha, cha. By the, Phing! I heard that God is a person and he's full of love and affection. So, cha, cha. I heard, I understood that sacred knowledge is necessary. But hearing from the pure devotee will put more than knowledge, it will put bhav, the ecstasy, the mood in our heart. And that's what we need more than anything. So the most important principle in our life is to hear from Sri Guru and pure Vaishnavas. Without that, everything else we do will never be enough. Because we need perfection of our spiritual life means bhav. We develop an ecstatic mood, our intimate, real mood with Krishna. And that will only come by drinking from the lips of someone who has that mood fully blooming in their heart. No, I'm just, what you were saying about the, listen to this, the city, it does help you to remember, and that's, that would be it, right? Yeah. So it's actually smaran. It's not shravan that we're doing, it's not shravan bhakti, it's not the devotional limb of hearing that we do when we hear a tape, it's smaran, if we remember. It's the limb of remembrance. You know, we remember that person. So the tape helps us to do smaran, but not shravan. Understand the difference? Best. Okay, um, uh, earlier you were speaking about, about uh, Paramatma. Paramatma speaks to you, and you hear that in the back of your mind. Um, sometimes uh, it's kind of we see the cartoons with the good angel and the bad angel. And you know, sometimes I, 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 you know, I don't hear all these good things, you know. And like, you know, what is that bad voice that speaks to you? Is that free will? What is, what is that, you know, because it's not always, you know, good. Because you're being trafficked, and you're like, mind. oh, that's guy, you know. And it's that, our mind. We are not our mind. You know, one thing first we understand philosophically, I'm not the body. Okay, I'm the soul, I'm not the body. But I'm also not the thoughts that are playing inside. There's all these crazy thoughts going on all the time. That's not me either. 
the mind is a sixth sense, and the senses want their objects. So the mind wants respect, so it thinks about, oh, in high school, that guy didn't treat me right, and like all kinds of crazy things come back in our mind. And I, I can't, I think about my wife and how she didn't do me right, and all these things, and like all kinds of things in the past are still in there in the mind. The mind wants its objects. It wants to be respected, it wants to enjoy, it wants to fantasize, it wants all kinds of things. It's always talking. That's not us. And so the more that we practice and we get, you know what actually liberates us from the mind and the body, identifying with them? is our relationship with Guru and Krishna. As we taste relationship with Guru and Krishna, as we have rela realization in our heart that they're present with me, that they love me, we can feel it clear as day when they're giving us mercy. They're noticing us and like, it's not something we can express with the senses, but every person knows at some moment you felt Guru Deva Krishna's mercy in your life. You feel the reality of their relationship. And as we advance and that relationship becomes more steady and thick, as we advance, we actually realize, by in the context of that relationship, I am a person who is part of a relationship with God. What I am is someone who is transcendental and pure and worthy of God's affection, who is adored by God. And Gurudev. I couldn't, it couldn't be that Gurudev loves this selfish, rotten bag of blood and bones and sin and all these things that my mind and senses have done for millions of lifetimes. Gurudev can't love that. It's like garbage on the street. He doesn't hate it either. He just doesn't have any interest in making relationship with that. But he has a keen interest. Gurudev has such a keen interest to make relationship with me. Which means implicitly, for someone so beautiful and astonishing from the spiritual world has come so far to find me. And at the first moment of initiation by mantra, gave himself to me with Guru Mantra. He gave himself to me. I must be something so attractive and worthy of love and affection that he's offered himself to me. So as we taste relationship with Guru and Krishna, we can distinguish that I'm not this crazy mind, and I'm not these senses that are always just naturally hungry for their self-interest. And we get less and less worried about what they want. And we get less and less caught up in falling for what they want. Okay, I hear you, but I'm not interested. And we get more and more absorbed in the relationship. We're interested in what Krishna wants, because it feels good to make him happy. So do you still have those uh, that, that fight with the mind? Do you still have... Is that constant, or at a certain point do you... The only time I don't do you... have that is when I sit on the mic and speak Hare Kata. Something miraculous happens when I sit here on the mic and I speak Hare Kata, and as long as you keep asking me questions, I'll just keep thinking about Krishna. I'm not thinking about anything but Krishna. But after I go home, then... Then I bombard you still. Yeah, but it's, it's a wrestling match, because ultimately everything is God and His energy, even the mind, even our karma, even everything. That's a very high, high kind of abstract understanding. But when we get a little understanding of that, then we realize we're in a wrestling match, and that wrestling match is only to get us in shape. It's meant to get us strong. So all these lusty things are coming, all these greedy things are coming. It's like before, I used to be like, oh God, I feel so bad, I'm so lusty, I'm so greedy, I'm so selfish, I'm so proud. And now it's like, oh, I gotta keep squaring off with this thing and I'm getting better at it as the years go by. So we can look at the mind as a test, a constant test. Yeah. It's the devil, and the devil is serving, he's the servant of God, everyone serves God. The devil, we have the devil on one shoulder, and he's actually such an intimate, special servant. He's doing that thing that no one else is qualified to do, you know, to try and turn our way. He's so audacious, he's so intimate to the Lord that he can try to turn our attention away from God. That's his job, turn your face away, and you're like, no! You know, and we fail again and again. Like Pujapada Bhagdan to Madhusudam Maharaj, he said it's like, in India there's the mongoose and he fights with cobras. Mm -hmm. And that real mongoose is real fast, but cobra's fast too, real fast. And if he gets bit, the mongoose, he runs away and he knows there's some herb. He'll eat that herb and cure himself. And when he gets strong again, he comes back and bam, right back in the fight. So it's like that with Maya, we're tangling with a poisonous snake. Our mind, our senses, our lust and greed and all these things. We're like the mongoose. And we get, when sometimes we get, ah, we fall down, we make a mistake, we get, we fail. Again and again fail. Dang, I'm still doing that? And we feel disappointed, but instead of like, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, we run to the medicine. We run to Gurudev and Krishna. Oh, I'm not giving up. I still want this fight. I still want this love and affection. I still have hope, Gurudev. I still, no matter if I've fallen on my face a thousand times, I still want this. And I know that Gurudev is always, no matter how many times you've fallen, it's in the past. Even if you fell down three minutes ago, now is a new time. Now is the time that's real. And now is the time that we have to do bhajan. We're not going to do bhajan in the future. We're not going to do bhajan in the past. If I failed a million times, even just ten seconds ago, you know, still, now I can make a new choice. We always have the free will. In this moment, I'm, in, I'm ready. Let's go. Again, let's go. And dive back into it. And we find out as we go along the line that it's all, 
you know, it's all good. He's helping us. He's doing, you know, alchemy. We're being cooked. We're being cooked and spiced. We're being burned pure. We're being tested. Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada said, there's no um, replacement for the benefit of the fire of ordeal, difficulties in our spiritual life. And once you take initiation, your whole life is your spiritual life. Even your divorce is a difficulty in your spiritual life. Even your sickness and your surgery and your everything, everything that happens to you, your failed business, your house burned down, your this, your that. Once you take initiation sincerely, all your karma has been transferred like we offer the boga to Krishna. What comes back looks like rice and dal and s strawberry cheesecake or whatever, but it's not. It's transcendental. It's prasadam. So our life looks like that. I'm getting divorced, I'm getting sick, I wrecked my car. But once we offered ourselves to Gurudev, he took all of our karma. And he's giving us back prashad. It's full of his grace. It's him, Gurudev's consciousness. It's not just like our karma coming to teach us the general principle. Gurudev is behind everything, extremely, intently, acutely invested in our spiritual success. And he's putting all these things. And if we just would like give attention, we would move so fast. Oh, Gurudev is teaching me, he's helping me. I should pay attention, take lessons, take notes. What's going on? But it's breaking my pride. Look how he's so expert to break my pride. Look what he's doing. Oh, wow. We are responsible to interpret our situation favorable for our spiritual life. That's our duty. Whatever happens, whatever it is, we have to be like that swan and drink the milk. What's going to nourish me from this situation? And what's not? Something that feels like, oh, I'm such a failure? Just throw that to the side. Oh, look. This is my new chance. Everything. If we can find that black gold, the mercy in suffering, oh, then you really hit the jackpot. You really hit the jackpot. Because then you're going to live 100% of the time in intimate communion with Sri Guru. And everything is just going to speak to you and you're just going to go up and up and up and up and up. And like Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, Atmani Vedana. It's Atmani Vedana song that I see suffering and happiness the same. Now that I've surrendered to you, now that I've offered myself to you, I see suffering and happiness exactly the same. Both of them are untying the knots of my ignorance. You're instructing me and teaching me and developing my heart through every single microscopic circumstance in my life. Wow, thank God. It's astonishing. God is real and He's speaking through everything. And He's helping through everything. He's working on those knots. And ow, it hurts. I don't want to get divorced. I don't, I'm holding on to the situation. I'm attached. We're fighting it. But we have to just go soft and let those loving hands serve us. Gurudev is actually serving us. He's working those acid crystals of bad conceptions and breaking it all up and making us soft. We have acid crystals in the muscle of our heart. He's breaking it up and making our heart soft. He's teaching us. First go soft. First surrender. Then we can learn more and more about love and devotion. But first we have to, the first step is trust. The whole process of this relationship is to become perfectly trusting and trustworthy. Right? When we're perfectly trusting, when whatever happens, whatever circumstance comes to us, we don't flinch and we know, I know you're doing it, I trust you, I don't like it, but I accept. Bring it. I trust you. Bring it, Gurudev, bring it. When we're fully trusting like that and fully trustworthy, means that we're not saying, oh, Gurudev, oh, Krishna, I want to serve you, and we're glancing over our shoulder at Maya, hey, girls, you know, hey, cash. Hey, material success. Hey, this thing that's going to make me happy other than Krishna. I have some shelter other than Krishna. I, we're saying, oh, Gurudev, I depend on you completely, but we're actually depending on other crutches and things that hold us up. Then we're not trustworthy. You're not going to give us mercy. The special mercy comes when we filled up with that special divine grace that's inexpressible with words. The limit of our words stops here. Real realization comes when we're fully trusting and trustworthy. We're just one-pointed. All I want is to serve you, and that's just the truth. That's just the honest truth. I trust you, and I trust you can trust me. Because he's a person, too. It's a relationship. We're falling in love with each other. You know, When you fully love and trust someone, then you can become very intimate. Intimacy that's like unthinkable with someone you don't trust. When you fully trust, you fully give yourself in a way you just can't with anyone else. And we fully give ourselves in a way to God that we can't give with anyone else, even lovers in this world. And and Krishna will fully give himself to us in a way that he can't with anyone else who's not his devotee. It's a matter of the whole thing, to put it simply as that, developing perfect trust and trustworthiness. Then he'll fill us up all this in a moment. Something, our whole 
paradigm changes, our whole existence goes to another dimension and continues to grow. Okay, what time is it? Did you have a question? What is the importance of wearing Kunti Malas on the neck? Because I'm saying, Krishna knows who am I or yeah. what is station. I don't need to show nobody. Like, yeah. because I'm wearing Kunti I'm a, a devotee. Yeah. Can you answer me that? Please? We don't need to show anybody anything, but we do need to show him. We make a, right now we're not really devotees. We're actually not. We're trying. We have an interest. But we're still so attracted to material things and we're still so interested in our body and we still so much believe with the body that honestly, we cannot be classified as a devotee. Not yet. And so, we're making, we have to make a show. We want to impress him that we're sincere. So we're making a show, not for anyone else, but for him. So we chant our japa and we put our tilak and we you know, do the whole rituals, the whole practices of spiritual life to show him, I want this, I want this. All we're really doing by everything we do is praying. Please give me mercy, I'm sincere, I want it. And we're showing him in every way that we can. And so we put this on to say, like, look, I'm yours. Like when we offer bhoga to Krishna, you know, devotees don't eat anything if it's not offered to Krishna. And Krishna doesn't eat anything unless it has tulsi on it. You're not interested. But tulsi, it doesn't matter if there's any mistakes you made or you don't have love and affection, you put tulsi, because <gasps> she's the goddess of bhakti. She's the very deity of devotion. And without her, we can't do anything. That's why we chant tulsi on a tulsi japa mala. Because our japa is what? What is the quality of our chanting? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Not so good. Me, anyway. But when I chant on that Tulsi Mala, Krishna accepts. Because he loves Tulsi. She's the goddess of devotion. She's the embodiment, the manifestation of bhakti. So just like we put a Tulsi leaf on top of Boga and we offer to Krishna, he accepts. So Gurudev put this Tulsi leaf on us. He put this Tulsi on us. We are the Boga. Gurudev is offering us to Krishna. And Krishna will accept if we have Tulsi. <coughs> Definitely, no matter what I am, rotten and full of faults, still Krishna, okay, no problem, you're my devotee, he can see. Sure, he knows our heart, but he's a simple person too, you know, it's simple. And also, Gurudev used to say that this means like, you know, street dog, dog in the street, running here and there and eating garbage and anything. He's just a street dog, and he causes trouble and mischief and howling at night, and then people call the pound, and the pound comes, and they catch him with a net, and they take him, and they give him a shot, and he goes to sleep forever. But if someone has a call, if a dog has a collar on, no, I'm not a street dog. I belong to so and so. I'm Kamala's dog. I have a home. This is my address. Then they don't touch it. So this means I'm not a street dog. Durga Devi, Maya Devi, who's punishing all the living beings, brutally punishing all the living beings, like a dog catcher. You dog eating garbage, useless nuisance. She don't do that to us because we're showing. No, look, I'm someone's. I belong to my guru. I belong to the Parampara of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I've been offered to Krishna by a pure devotee. I'm out of your jurisdiction. Yamaraj says, those who wear this, I cannot touch them. When death comes, you cannot go in front of the court of Yamaraj if you die with this on. If you die without Tulsi on, no one knows what your destiny will be. Yamaraj says, bring those persons to me who don't wear Tilak, who don't put Tulsi on their neck. Bring those persons to me and I will judge them and punish them. But those who wear this, Yamara said, just that. You just put tilak on, you just wear this. I have no right to punish those persons. Because Krishna is my boss, and they're his servants. I have no right. Should we wear it then around the neck or loose? Um, I wear the way that our acharyas did. The way that our, we should, everything we do, we should try to follow in the footsteps of those who are perfect. <coughs> the perfect examples. You know, acharya means whose achar, his activities are exemplary. We should follow the achar of the acharya. And our Guru Parampara, they always wear like this. And three lines. If we open it long, then we have one. And okay, it's touching us. That's good for us. But three means body, speech, and mind. My whole person has been offered. If it's one, then well, which one is it? Is it my body? And then my speech and mind I'm going to use for mine? Body three means body. This is the way Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has taught us. And this is when we come in a line. When we take initiation, we commit to a line to, okay, I don't know better than my Guru. I don't know better than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We actually, the only thing that we have to offer is our free will. We don't own anything. This body belongs to God, our breath, our very soul belongs to God. We have one possession, and that's our free will, our independence. That's the only thing we can offer. I offer Gurudev my body. No, you didn't. That's Krishna's already. It's not yours to offer. What you have is a choice. And so when we take initiation, what we offer is, I, I choose 
to give my power of choice to you. I choose to have more faith in your wisdom than in my speculations and urges. I choose to follow you submissively. And once you do that, once you take shelter of Gurudev, you have no right to like take back. You know, like a woman has one husband, when she married, she has no right to call her boyfriends and like go out and go to the coffee shop along with them and get a drink. Like, no right. No right to flirt with Maya. No right to flirt with independence. Every time that we do anything that's not for the service of Guru and Krishna while we're wearing this or after having taken initiation and offered ourselves to Krishna, we do anything else apart from their service. This is deep hypocrisy. Initiation is like, I've offered myself to God and now I'm doing whatever I like. No. So, but we're in school, you know, we're not, I'm not up to that standard either. I'm doing, my mind is doing a thousand things that are not pleasing to Krishna. I'm trying, okay, bring it back. What we do is fail and keep trying. Our job is to fail. If we don't try, then we can't fail. And by failing, we get stronger. By fighting with that snake and getting bit again and again and again, we become immune to the poison. So we're not able to do bhajan. We're not able to do that high standard of things. We have to hear about what is the pure standard of real bhakti. We're not actually able to come up to that immediately. But we have to try. Gurudev said one time in the LA temple, which is now finished and closed, he spoke there, he said, you're working so hard, but you should know that all of your efforts will come to zero. Time will take everything away. But that you try, that is called bhakti. It's not what you accomplish. It's not how many disciples I made, or how many temples I opened, or how many artis I do. Or It's not what I do. It's that I'm giving myself by trying to do it. Even if I fail, Gurudev and Krishna, they don't care if I fail or not. They just want me to try to give my heart. Will be a tapasya, maybe for me, because when this gets wet in my, my kunti, it gets uncomfortable in my neck. So what is that? Um, That's you know? your bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you can either do it, gets, you can either do it to pasya or you wear it loose. You can either do it to pasya for your Guru and Krishna and you tolerate or you dry it, you can stick a little towel in there and you can pinch it dry when you come out from the shower. You can dry it. Yeah. We're not, we have intelligence to like figure things out. Or, if you can't do that, then you'd wear it loose. But it's not recommended, but at least wear it. You don't want to have a car accident and die without Tulsi on your neck, I'll tell you that. Even there's a story of one, there was one Muslim guy, completely, you know, the Muslims in India, they're not so much respected because they've destroyed the temple so much and they've destroyed the deities and they've like, killed and raped people and they forced people at sword point, you have to become a Muslim or like... So they're not so much appreciated by the Hindus. And they're considered to be like pretty demoniac for the activities. I'm not saying all Muslims, but the activities of Islam in India, in history, has been extremely demoniac. But still, there was one history, there was one guy, a Muslim guy, and he was passing outside, passing stool in the morning, and um, a, a wild boar came. You know, pigs, they like to eat fresh poo. He could smell it coming, and he came running from the forest. But he was a wild boar from the jungle, so huge tusks. And when he came to eat that stool, he just threw that guy to the side as he was passing stool, and he just tore his guts open with his tusk. Just tore him. And that guy, as he fell and died, he landed on a Tulsi plant. His body was touching a Tulsi plant as he died. It's in history, they say that he didn't... Even after such a sinful life, killing cows, you know, destroying deities, all types of terrible things he did. But he died touching Tulsi, and he didn't have to see Yamaraj, any sinful reaction. He was purified by the touch of Tulsi, mm -hmm. just by touching her when he died. So we don't know when we're going to die. I always put Tilak on, because I want to wear Tilak when I'm dying when I die. You know? <laughs> so it's, you know, this is, this is, you know what this is? Tilak, where it comes from? Anybody know? Is this the Tulsi leaf and this is the footprint of God? Well, it's God is one, but two. So Radha Krishna, but they're one, and this is the Tulsi leaf offered their feet. That's like the symbology. That's what it represents. This is the temple, the mind, let the divine couple be sitting in my mind with devotion. But what is it really? This one time, Krishna was in Dwarka after leaving Vrindavan, and he manifested, he wanted to show the world the glory of Vrindavan, the devotees of Vrindavan. So he'd said, oh, I have such a pounding headache, I have such pain, so sick, I'm so much suffering. And no one, so many doctors came and they couldn't help him. And finally Narad Muni came and he said, Lord, you're the Lord. <laughs> you know everything, so what can we do to help you? This is some pastime of yours you're doing. 
but please tell us what this is. And Krishna said, there's only one thing that's going to help me. And he was laying on his bed, really pathetic, and everyone like loves Krishna, so their hearts are like twisted ah, to see him suffering. They can't tolerate it. And he told Narada, there's only one thing that will cure me. The foot dust from my devotees. If my devotee would put the, the dust of their feet on my head, then immediately my fever would go. And so Narada turned to the queens, Krishna's queens, and he said, can you do? Can you put your foot dust on Krishna's head? Then he'll get better. And they all were like, our husband is Bhagavan. He's God. We can't put our foot dust on the head of Bhagavan. And Krishna went, as uh, Narad Muni, he went here and there and there, and he asked so many devotees, can you please? Krishna's suffering. And they're like, Krishna's suffering? I'll do anything. Can you put your foot dust on his head? <gasps> no, I can't. I'll go to hell. You know, he's God. Finally, Narad Muni, he went to Vrindavan. He came to the Brajit Gopis. And they said, oh, you're coming from Krishna. How's Krishna? He said, Krishna's suffering. He has a headache. And they no, Krishna has a headache. They couldn't tolerate, they were crying and pulling their hair. Krishna has a headache. They cannot tolerate. Love means you cannot tolerate the slightest inconvenience or displeasure of your beloved. It hurts you thousands of times more than it hurts them. So they are feeling so much pain. What can we do? Is there anything we can do? And Narada said, yes. Krishna just needs a foot dust from his devotees. And they said, is that all? They started grabbing the dust and cramming it on their feet, cramming it like all gopis, rubbing dust on their feet. And they made a mountain of foot dust, gopis foot dust. And Narad, he took that to Dwarka. And from that, they painted on Krishna, on his body, this made it cream from the foot dust of the gopis. And ah, by the touch of the feet of his pure, selfless devotees, he was pacified. But Narad Muni told those gopis, don't you know you'll go to hell? He's Bhagavan, you're putting your feet on Bhagavan's head. Don't you know you'll go to hell for that? And they said, we don't care. What is hell for us? If Krishna has a headache, we'll do anything for him. Their standard of love and affection is incomparable. So that place, where that dust, so much, thousands of gopis' foot dust was collected, that place is where we harvest this tilak, comes from there. Gopi Chandan means the foot dust of the gopis. And we put this on, we're putting that, their mood, their aspiration, it's not just the picture, the symbology, but we're putting the holy clay, you know, that dust from a holy place, from the feet of those persons who, they don't care if they go to hell, they just want to love God to the utmost degree. It's the embodiment, the very cream, the, you know, the oil, the essence of causeless, pure love of God. And we're putting that on our mind and hoping it will soak into my thoughts and that my consciousness will follow in that. Why? It, today I was thinking about this past time. Mm. <laughs> and then you speak. <laughs> mm. The group is food dust. Mm. Yeah. Question. I haven't been to India. What can I get for that? Where can you get tilak? Oh. <laughs> she, she, <called. laughs> she didn't give me last time, she forgot. <laughs> I asked you last time. <laughs> yeah. They always have any little things you need like that, you can go to the, any Hare Krishna temple. Coconut Grove temple in the bookstore, they probably have tilak. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 You'll get it here. Oh, here we are. Krishna fulfills all desires. Yeah, you some. So it's one thing, it's like, you know when you go to the supermarket, and there's a barcode on things, you want to buy some can of beans or whatever. And they go, dee, dee. they put it through the thing and the barcode, the little laser reads it. They put it down, face the can face down and they run it on the thing. And dee, dee. So when we come in front of Takoji and we lay down, we put our face face down this barcode, they're reading this barcode, this is our aspiration, that we want to serve the lotus feet, the Tulsi leaf means devotion. We want to serve Radha Krishna, the divine couple in Vrindavan. We're putting our deep, deep, please know me, and yes, I accept. <laughs> uh, one thing that's, that's, that's kind of uh, disturbed the, the materialist in me is, I was listening to a lecture on the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and it said that um, if Krishna sees some, some uh, spark of, of devotion in you, he's going to take away all your, all your material, you know, take away your house, Not your money. Not a spark and, of devotion, that he sees a burning fire. Okay. Even Srila Prabhupada, you know our show Prabhupada, yes. who saved the world, yes. <laughs> by taking sannyas and preaching everywhere, he hesitated for decades to take sannyas because he was afraid of that verse. He read that verse mm -hmm. in Bhagavatam that Krishna says, when I really have full mercy for someone, I take away everything from them. Why? So that then they have nothing but him. Right. They have no one but him and 24 hours a day they're just with him. No bills to pay, no kids to feed, no wife or husband, no nothing, no car to drive, no house even. He takes away everything. But he doesn't do that to us, he does that to someone in the stage of Bhav, who's like... It's like when the, we mentioned the other day when a tree, when the fruit is ripe on the tree, 
Okay, one lady, she came to Gurudev and she said, I want to leave everything. I want to give up my family and come and surrender and live in the temple with you. And Gurudev said, no, no way, you're not ready. She said, no, no, I want to, I want to give my whole life, Gurudev, I want to. You're speaking about this surrender and everything and I want to give it. And he said, no, you're not ready. Gurudev said, if you're asking me, you're not ready. When a fruit is ripe, it doesn't need permission, it just falls off the tree. And there's no discussion. Even it says, get back on the tree, you can't put it back on, that's it. <laughs> so when the fruit is ripe, when our love of God is really coming, when that bob is really coming and we're just about perfect, when that mango of our heart is sweet and just about ripe, it just falls off the tree. Everything, all these actual entanglements and the burden of owning things and having relatives and all these things that take so much energy, they just go away. You drop off. You drop out. You take renounced order from the heart. Not from, not to preach and if I take sannyas then everyone will respect me and that will help the preaching mission. No. It's a heart sannyas and it's natural. Nothing about this process is like violent or like uprooting or like ah. It's natural. It happens, everything happens in its own stage and when it happens, it's the perfect thing to happen. To take now to leave everything, to lose everything and have your business broken and be, you know, you're not ready for that. Frankly, you're not qualified to have everything taken away. Because <laughs> what would you do? But cry for everything that you lost. You wouldn't be crying for Krishna. Those who are really qualified when everything is taken away, they just cry to Krishna. But we're not there yet. So if we lost everything, we would cry for our wife and our house and our stuff. And that wouldn't help us spiritually. When it's the right time and it will help us spiritually, then everything gets taken away. And that's the greatest possible mercy. And there's no loss. Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar said, If you give up everything for Krishna, you lose nothing and you gain everything. You lose nothing. If you lost everything, but you lost nothing. There was nothing there, actually. When our eyes are open spiritually, we see there was nothing. It was just a dream and I was all caught up in it, but actually there was no substance. It didn't mean anything. The loss or gain or sons dying, a wife divorcing or a husband betraying. And actually, none of it means anything at all. Nothing. It has zero meaning. But... Um, one last question. Um, is it bad to, to chant the Lakshmi Gayatri? Yes. Okay. It's not... Okay. There's nothing... No such thing as good and bad. We decide what's good and bad according to our own perspective. Some people think it's really good to sell drugs. They grow drugs and they sell drugs and they think this is really good. And they really think that their friends are getting happy by this and they're making money and they, you know... Some people think that's good. Someone else thinks that's really bad. So it's relative depending on your perspective. There's no real such thing as good and bad. Even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that. There's no such thing as good and bad. Us who are fixed in material duality, we decide this thing, but it's not real. But there is what... There's not good and bad, but there's favorable and unfavorable for our spiritual growth. Some things are unfavorable, you know? And they're fine details, like we know the gross things, drinking alcohol, taking drugs, having illicit relationships. These things are going to... Unfavorable. It's an anchor down. You're not going to grow. But there's subtler things, like there was one lady, Nani, who was coming with us in Trinidad. One month I spoke Srimad Bhagavatam. All different villages, all over Trinidad. One cover to cover, one first, second, third, fourth, all the whole Srimad Bhagavatam for a month. And this Nani, this old grandmother, she came. She came to every program, listening to every program. She's like one of the only people that came to the whole thing. But she lives a bar, on top of a bar that she owns for 60 years. She's been operating a bar and selling alcohol. And I told her night after night, she said, we, they sell meat, chicken and things and hamburgers and alcohol. But she says, but ain't nothing in my mouth. 60 <laughs> years and ain't nothing in my mouth. <laughs> you don't understand that selling it, you get exactly the same result. You might as well be drinking it. You might as well be eating flesh. If you maintain your life by selling alcohol, Sri Prabhupada said that those who sell drugs and alcohol, the fit punishment for them is they should have death sentence because it's so destructive for society. He said, if someone opens a liquor shop, they should be killed. That's Sri Prabhupada's opinion. And Manu Samhita, that's how to protect society. It's like, you can't do that. That's an anchor down, and your spiritual life is not going to go. She came for one month hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, and at the end she was exactly the same. I saw, and the other devotees that were coming, the sincere Manu Prabhu and Sita Devi, from who live in the temple, and they're really sincere, and they're following sincerely, and their whole mind is for that. I could see in their eyes their spiritual growth from hearing Bhagavatam for a month. I could see it. I could hear it in speaking with them. And she came to the same programs, but because she's got this anchor down, by sinful means she's living by that, she's not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. So, 
the point was about Lakshmi Gayatri. It's not, obviously it's not sinful, but it's not what Gurudev gave you. Did he give you that mantra? No. No. So, you can't chant a mantra, you can't chant a mantra without, without being given by Guru. First of all, you can't chant a Gayatri mantra that's not given by your Guru or it has the opposite effect. It can be destructive to chant a Gayatri mantra that hasn't been given to you by Sri Guru. Second of all, if you did get that mantra from someone, that person becomes your Guru. And you can't have more than one Diksha Guru. So you can only chant the Diksha mantras given by your Diksha Guru. Third, that mantra is not favorable to developing pure love for Radha Krishna. It will mutate your aspiration. Your spiritual form that's trying to grow to serve Radha Krishna and Vrindavan will mutate and come out. You won't, be, you won't make it. Gayatri is no joke. Especially chanting Diksha Guru is like, just don't do it. Just stop. Just don't do it. That's the simple answer. Okay, one one last question. Now that you mentioned the the, the lady in, in Trinidad that was not drinking, but um, it brought something to my to my head. When I when I moved to to Naples, I had this suitcase that was full of negatives from the '90s when I used to live on South Beach and take pictures and all this. Stuff. So I thought, you know, when I packed this away, I thought, wow, there's a great story to be told here. So I started a, a documentary on how South Beach changed from from God's waiting room into what it is now. Is that sinful? To to document something it's that karma. transformed, karma. you know, it's, <laughs> it's not good or bad. It's just karma. It doesn't seem. Sin I mean, I don't know what it is. Is it? Is, you know better than me. Is it sinful? Well, <laughs> well, you look at South Beach. South Beach is not a saintly, saintly place. But if I paint, book is a book. but if history I paint it, if I paint it in a picture of, of not glorifying that, is that less it's of a karmic? No. It's like a history project. Sounds like it's just neutral. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't do anything for your bhakti. It doesn't do anything yeah. for your life. So. Like well, I was, how you I was, well, well, I was doing it to, for, for monetary reasons yeah. as well. Yeah. To, to, to it's make. just karma, it's just yeah. a job. Once it's That's not the same as selling alcohol. alcohol. That's okay. not the same as selling meat in a restaurant. Right. If it's not okay. meat and fish and alcohol. Okay. Then. Jack, thank you. It's knowledge. It's material, but it's knowledge. You're a teacher. One question. Okay, one last question. We were given Maha Mantra by our Maharaj. Uh, we will be perfect that and join to uh, sing. What? Uh, you? We enjoy to sing and chant. Now, do we have to ask him for another mantra? Yes. Okay. Maha mantra is everything. But there's two initiations. But well, there's really one initiation. And the second one is the real one. So the first initiation we're given is Maha mantra. Mm -hmm. Maha mantra is everything. And we chant that for a while and it purifies us and it makes us ready gradually. It takes away our falls. It purifies us and lifts us up until we're ready and sober enough and then we're ready to take the second initiation which is the real initiation and that's called Diksha. And that's the time when Gurudev will give you eight Gayatri mantras. And you chant those three times a day like this silently in your heart and what they do is those mantras they specifically develop your eternal, they connect, they establish and connect and open up your eternal relationship with Sri Guru, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Radha Krishna. They open the relationship. And then the Maha Mantra is higher than them. The Maha Mantra comes before and the Maha Mantra comes after. But in the middle, there's these Gayatri Mantras. It's like rice. You want to eat rice. So Maha Mantra is the rice. But you need water and you need fire and you need a pot. You need all these ingredients to cook. Them. So the Gayatri Mantras, they're like the stuff that you need to cook that rice to make that Maha Mantra. The relationship open up. And then when you chant the Maha Mantra with Sambandha, with relationship, the real fruit will come. The Prema Bhakti will come. So definitely when you're ready, you take Diksha. But it's a very serious commitment because if someone takes Harinam, the first initiation, and then later they change their mind, it's kind of okay. It's bad luck. You know, it's unfortunate. We cry for them. Oh, But if someone takes Diksha and then changes their mind, it's really heavy because Diksha is a time of like tying a knot. It's more than marriage. You know, divorce is very common in our society now, but in Vedic culture and human culture, it's, it's illegal. You seal for this life. You become life partners. You're like one soul and two bodies, and you just can't cut that, you know. But it's more than that with Sri Guru. When you take Diksha, it's like, it's very, very deep, and it's a very, very big offense. It's a big insult after taking Diksha and offering yourself to say no thanks and turn away. So that's the thing that we have to be really, really sure. I'm going to do this and this alone for the rest of my life. I can put Paramahamsa Yogananda in the box and say thank you very much. You helped me on my way, but now I'm ready to go further. Dikshas is deep and it's full commitment.
about the difference between um, Bajan and Kirta. There's a difference? Yeah. Well, like generally, you mean like when we say we're going to sing bhajans, we're going to do bhajans and kirtans? I see that the devotees, they use the word in different ways. They use it to mean bhajans means like bhajahure mana, kohe vaishnava talk, or different songs. And then kirtan, they seem to mean nam kirtan by that. But chanting the Lord's name, form, qualities, and pastimes are about his associates. Ohe Vaishnav Thakur, that's kirtan. When we open our mouth and we sing about the Lord and his associates and his qualities, that's called kirtan anga bhakti, the limb of kirtan. Chanting, service by the speech. Or if I'm getting class, this is also kirtan. When we use our speech to serve Bhagavan, when we're preaching, when we're talking to a co worker, or you know, our mother's dying in the hospital, and we tell her you're not the soul, you're not the body or the soul, and Krishna's God, this is also kirtan. When we use our speech, this is all of it is kirtan. And bhajans, the devotees say in a general way to mean the songs. But really, what bhajan is? Bhajan means worship. And bhajan, the fullest, most precise, actual meaning of bhajan is what you do, not with your mind and senses, but what you do with your heart when your bhav comes. When the stage of bhav comes, and you can close your eyes and you forget the world completely, and in your perfected spiritual form in your heart, you serve Radha Krishna. That's called bhajan. So none of us is doing bhajan. Thank you. We're doing sadhan. Hopefully, we're trying to do sadhan. We're doing practice with our mind and senses. Now we're in the stage of using our mind and senses, our speech to chant, our ears to hear, our hands to cook and worship. We're using our mind and senses. But bhajan begins when we're purified enough that we can start to function deeper than the mind and senses. When we start to function with the soul, the spiritual body. It's a deep stage. That's the real meaning of bhajan. <laughs> so you, anything you want to say? You understand everything? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have to be a pure devotee in order to go back to Godhead? Yes. Or we'll just take continual births until we reach that point of being a pure devotee? Can you offer Krishna a sour green mango? No. Unless you're gonna like chop it up and cut, cook it into some, some sour sauce. Chutney. Chutney. <laughs> you have to give ripe, full, perfect, sweet. You know, Shastra says you're not allowed to give buds, flower buds. You have to offer blooming, fragrant flowers. So the heart has to be fully blooming. Then we'll go. Then we'll give him pleasure. If we go back home to Godhead, okay. Last thing I'll tell you. I promise, and then I'm gonna stop because hungry and uh. Arty and Takuri is waiting here to get worshipped tonight. He's more important than us. But last thing, I'll say one story about Gurudev. So it's worth saying. When Gurudev first came to the West, 1996, when he first came to America, he went to Badger. There's a devotee named Nir Gunaprabhu, a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And Nir Gunaprabhu, he hosted Srila Gurudev in his house. He didn't know him really, but he knew he was dear to Srila Prabhupada. He gave Prabhupada samadhi. He sent all the things to America. And he was, Prabhupada called him at the end of his pastime. And Prabhupada said he was his transcendental affection between them and eternal love between them. And, Prabhupada told his disciples, you can hear from Narayan Maharaj and Srila Bhakti Rakshak Shira Maharaj. Those are the people that Srila Prabhupada specifically authorized his devotees. You can hear and continue under their guidance. He openly said that. There's letters. Everyone knows that. Srila Bhakti Rakshak Shira Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada said, even I look up to him as a Shiksha Guru, so what to speak of the benefit you'll get? And Srila Gurudev, even though he was junior, he was senior in sannyas to Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada loved him too much, too much. He trusted him so much with his whole mission, his disciples, he said, you take care. So anyway, near Guna Prabhu, he only knew that. Only all the thing he knew about Gurudev was Prabhupada liked him, so I like him. I invite him. He needs a place to stay, so he called him to his house. And that time, Gurudev didn't have any disciples yet. And he was just, you know, in the recent years, there was, Gurudev had like 200,000 disciples or something, and you try to get near him, and there's bodyguards, and there's like Prajanath Prabhu and Mara Maharaj, and you can't get in there. It's very difficult. But at that time, Gurudev was just alone in his room with the door open. Mm -hmm. And near Guna Prabhu, because it was his house and there was just nobody really around, he just went in to see what's, what's Narayan Maharaj doing. And he went and he saw that Srila Gurudev was sitting on the bed chanting his Anik, his Gayatri Mantras, midday. And he was absorbed in near Guna Prabhu. He was astonished because he looked and he saw that Srila Gurudev was completely gone. He was completely gone from this plane. He was somewhere else. The body was sitting there. But he could just he was just struck by the fact that this person is not just like thinking deeply or concentrating, but he's gone. And Yoguna Prabhu was so struck by that presence of Gurudev, like like an empty flute. 
he just sat down on the floor and just watched Gurudev finish his onik. And after 10 minutes, when Gurudev finished his Gaichi mantras, he opened his eyes and he saw Nyaguna Prabhu sitting in front of him. And he said, I was just there. Wow. wow. And he said, and I can take you there right now. And he said, but what would you do? <laughs> he said, first, I will have to give you some training. But it has that power to take, he said, I could take you there right now. But what will you do? Your mango's not ripe. What will you do in that realm where everybody, nobody misses a beat? You know, you see like Britney Spears or Michael Jackson or whoever on the, on the Super Bowl halftime show and they're all dancing at the same time. All perfect tune and they don't miss a beat. They're perfectly, the music and the whole thing and they're just like right on, you know, 100% and everyone's like, wow. The spiritual world is like that. Everyone is on beat. Nobody misses a beat. Everyone is completely in tune with what Krishna and Radhika need and what they're feeling in their heart and how to serve them and everyone is completely genius. Even if you have Prem, you're not qualified. You need more than Prem. You need Prem and Sneha and Man and Pranay and Rag, Anurag, Bhav, Mahabhav. When we come to the cusp of Mahabhav, when we are tuned to the level of Radha Krishna, when we come to their level, pure as them, as loving genius as them, as fresh and graceful as them, then we can enter into their service and we won't miss a beat. We'll actually be an ornament in their pastimes. Like Radhisika is so beautiful but her dasis, they cover her with so many jewels and bangles and nose ring and all these things. And if she's dancing and one ankle bell falls off, then everyone stops because they can hear, oh, this ankle bell's missing, the music stops and they fix it. So we become like that. When you're perfect, you're like an ornament in the divine couple's pastimes. It's so perfect, fits so perfectly. And without you, if you would be not there, something would be missing. Or if you would miss a beat, it's like, eh, everything stops. You know, Ross Lila's going, thousands and thousands of gopis are dancing. When Radhika's ankle bells break, everything stops. They can hear it. Thousands of gopis dancing with their ankle bells all making sound and Krishna playing the flute and singing at the top of their throats. And one ankle bell of Radhika's comes loose. And they know that something's missing and they stop. They're that in tune to like, everything is perfect. So if you go there and not ripe yet, not perfect, pure devotee yet, yeah. we're just going to be 24 hours a day, the, like, the offbeat, you know, loser. <laughs> the fifth if, wheel. It's not a question of if. You can't go there if, if you're not. Right, and you can't. You, know, you can't. That stage. But that's why. Yeah. yeah. That's why. Thank you. Because the whole spiritual world is for Krishna's happiness. So we have to be able to give him happiness. Not okay that he'll tolerate us like the big brothers, the big brother and all his friends, they're playing and then the little brother's tagging along and they don't really want him, he's kind of annoying. But they let the little brother come along. It's not like that. There's no room in the spiritual world for like tolerating us. Gurudev and Vaishnavas, they tolerate us now because they have hope for us. But that place is only for the big kids. So we're all working on our choreography. So to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Y